significantly reduce minoxidil sulfate accumulation in the dermopapilla cells. And that's huge because it shows that even if the conversion to minoxidil sulfate happens smoothly, a breakdown in these two transporter protein systems can shut the whole process down. Now, we already have addressed the issue for points one and two, that respectively being skin penetration and enzymatic activation. Using liposomes helps the delivery and stability of minoxidil sulfate. Minoxidil sulfate, as we must remember, is an unstable compound in an aqueous solution. Using liposomes allows us to prevent its degradation or limit it as best as we can, because we're going to be putting the minoxidil sulfate into a sort of spherical lipid encapsulation, and it's going to be kind of shielded away from the solution at large, which substantially slows down its degradation. In the last video, I briefly talked about some of the bottlenecks concerning minoxidil efficacy, whether or not we're talking about regular topical minoxidil, oral minoxidil, or even by extension, minoxidil sulfate, the very thing that I'm trying to like push here, right? So let's recap real quick. Number one being the skin penetration delivery. Topical minoxidil in its standard alcohol and propylene glycol vehicle has to work its way past the stratum corneum, that is the skin's outer barrier. And then it has to reach the outer root sheath or the ORS, that's the other term for it, of the hair follicle. And that's where the real action happens. Some people have tried using tretinoin to improve this step and it helps by increasing the skin's permeability and accelerating cellular turnover. In doing so, it potentially boosts differentiation markers and upregulates the skin's metabolic machinery. But importantly, tretinoin doesn't directly switch on the sulforotransferase enzyme. It just seemingly alters the epidermal microenvironment, especially in the ORS and upper follicle making it more metabolically active. So it's an indirect boost at best. Number two, we have the enzymatic activation. So once inside the ORS, the inactive parent compound minoxidil needs to be converted into minoxidil sulfate by the enzyme SALT1A1 or sulforotransferase. However, we have an issue at hand. Sulforotransferase enzymatic activity varies widely from person to person. If your enzyme activity is low, you're not a responder, plain and simple. That's one of the biggest reasons why people just never see results from topical minoxidil, no matter how consistent they are. And if your enzyme levels are typical, then you'll just get mediocre or modest results. And let's be real, some people want more out of it, so probably makes sense to kind of get that active minoxidil sulfate in a liposomal encapsulation so it's stable right to the scalp. Number three, follicular transport. Even when minoxidil does get converted to minoxidil sulfate, the job's not done. <laughs> the active compound still needs to be moved. First, it's pumped out of the keratinocytes by an efflux transporter called ABCC3. Then it needs to be pulled back into the dermopapilla cells by another transporter called SLCO3A1. These are both transporter proteins and how well they work can actually vary depending on your genetics. If there's a variation in just one of these transporters, that alone can bottleneck the entire process. And that brings us to what I call the transporter bottleneck. If either of these transporter systems isn't working properly, the amount of active drug that actually makes it into the hair follicle drops dramatically. The whole thing relies on a tight cellular traffic control network. One weak link in the chain and minoxidil's effectiveness can tank. Now, we already have addressed the issue for points one and two, that respectively being skin penetration and enzymatic activation. Using liposomes helps the delivery and stability of minoxidil sulfate. Minoxidil sulfate, as we must remember, is an unstable compound in an aqueous solution. Using liposomes allows us to prevent its degradation or limit it as best as we can, because we're going to be putting the minoxidil sulfate into a sort of spherical lipid encapsulation, and it's going to be kind of shielded away from the solution at large, 
which substantially slows down its degradation. So with that, we don't need to worry about local conversion into minoxidosulfate with sulfurotransferase levels as the molecule is already present. So this leaves us with the transporter bottleneck. First, we need to understand what's going on here. A 2024 study by Juan Jimenez Cahi et al. titled, quote, Hair Follicle Sulfurotransferase Activity and Effectiveness of Oral Minoxidil and Androgenetic Alopecia, unquote, took a hard look at how minoxidil actually gets into the cells that matter, specifically the dermal papilla cells, which are the control center for hair growth. What they found was huge. Like I mentioned before, the two key transporter proteins, SLC2289, for uptake, and ABCC3, for efflux, form a critical loop that regulates how minoxidil sulfate and minoxidil in general moves within the hair follicle. When we talk about uptake and efflux, we're basically talking about cellular traffic, the way substances move in and out of cells. Efflux is the process of pushing something out of a cell, and in our case, after minoxidil gets converted to minoxidil sulfate inside the keratinocyte cells, it, well, has to get out. And that's the job of the transporter protein called ABCC3. Then comes the uptake, which is the pulling in of that compound into new cells. Here, another transporter protein called SLC2289 acts as a sort of delivery door for the derma papilla cell, the key player in regulating hair growth. If monoxidal sulfate doesn't make it into the derma papilla cell, well, then it can't do its job. No delivery, no result. Now back to the paper. The researchers confirmed that these two proteins, these transporter proteins, are very important for minoxidil sulfate's effectiveness using in vitro models of outer root sheath keratinocytes and dermapilla cells. They use specific inhibitors and gene knockdown techniques to show that by blocking ABCC3 or SLCO3A1 significantly reduce minoxidil sulfate accumulation in the dermopapilla cells. And that's huge because it shows that even if the conversion to minoxidil sulfate happens smoothly, a breakdown in these two transporter protein systems can shut the whole process down. They even found that SLCO3A1 is highly expressed in dermopapilla cells, while ABCC3 is more active in keratinocytes, confirming their specialized roles. What's more is that the study noted that expression levels of these transporters can be genetically variable among individuals, which means some people are just hardwired to transport monoxidal sulfate less effectively. That could explain why even high responders to oral or topical monoxidal sometimes suddenly plateau or even, in some cases, other people just don't respond at all, even if they might have a high sulfurotransferase enzymatic activity. So bottom line, this isn't just some sort of enzymatic kind of game anymore where we're just exclusively looking at the sulfurotransferase enzymes. No, now we have to deal with essentially <laughs> drug traffic control, all right? And that sounds crazy, but we're dealing with these transporters in these cells, right? A, B, C, C, 3 in the keratinocytes and S, L, C, O3A1 going to the dermal papilla cells. This serves as the transporter bottleneck. Now, imagine somebody has hyperactive ABCC3, meaning their keratinocytes are pushing the monoxidal sulfate super quickly. On one hand, that's good. The drug isn't getting stuck inside the wrong cells. But there's an issue here. If this is happening too aggressively or too quickly, there may not be enough drug sitting around long enough to be effectively taken up by SLC22A9 on the other side. But by the way, this is assuming that the conversion is even happening in the keratinocytes in the first place, right? Because if your ABCC3 transporter is just way too active, what if it is pushing the minoxidil out of the keratinocytes before it even has time to transform into 
minoxidil sulfate by meeting the sulforotransferase inside of those keratinocytes? What if that's the case? And if that's the case, now you have an issue where hyperactive ABCC3 is a huge problem in its own right. Maybe you have underactive SLCO3A1, where you just don't have enough of that sort of transporter protein that's supposed to take the minoxidil sulfate and put it in the derma papilla. Now, I can think of a way to kind of remedy the hyperactive ABCC3 efflux transporter protein. And this may be done by saturation. In pharmacology, there's this concept called transporter saturation. Transporter proteins like ABCC3 have a maximum capacity, just like checkout lanes at a grocery store. So if you flood the system with enough of the product, in this case, a high concentration of minoxidil sulfate, you can overwhelm or saturate ABCC3. It reaches its limit, and once that happens, any extra minoxidil sulfate sticks around longer in the outer root sheath. Now, again, we don't really care too much about this particular process. It's even arguable if you really need the minoxidil sulfate to go into this keratinocytes because, well, we already have it converted, right? So we don't really need to worry about ABCC3 too much. But again, there is a potential that it will kind of go into the keratinocytes anyway, right? So we kind of sidestep the need for there to be some sort of transformation that occurs in the keratinocytes because, well, we already have the minoxidil sulfate. So we've saturated the keratinocytes. If it is to go inside of them, we've already saturated it enough where ABCC3 shouldn't be an issue. In fact, it's just going to just leave the minoxidil sulfate in the substrate. Our primary issue here is that we need SLCO3A1, this other sort of transporter protein, we need that to grab onto the minoxidil sulfate and deliver it to the derma papilla. But now that you have an abundance of minoxidil sulfate just sitting around, it could be the case that, okay, you have more of that kind of like to be used in the derma papilla where the only bottleneck you can possibly have at that point, which is going to be very unlikely, right? But if it should happen, it should just be the SLCO3A1 bottleneck. So just to recap, a high local concentration of minoxidil sulfate may help overwhelm the efflux system by creating a surplus, and now you suddenly, again, have that minoxidil sulfate just floating around waiting to be used. So, this is mostly theoretical, I will admit that, and it's based on these papers that we're looking at, but I do think that it's probably a bit rare that you have an issue with ABCC3, SLCO3A1, and also low sulforotransferase enzymatic activity, right? If you just have the liposomal minoxidil sulfate that delivers the minoxidil sulfate, even if your keratinocytes uptake the minoxidil sulfate, ABCC3 should be putting it right out back into the substrate. And again, I keep reiterating myself, but I just want to be clear. Maybe at that point, SLCO3A1 should be the only issue. But at the very least, the benefit here is that you already have that abundance of minoxidil sulfate just sitting there, right? And who knows? Maybe you wouldn't have had that because... Maybe you don't have that high enough sort of sulforotransferase enzymatic activity to begin with, right? Which, again, just comes back to SALT1A1 kind of being that ultimate or, I guess, overarching rate limiter, so to speak. Because if you don't really have much to produce, right, of minoxyl sulfate, you're just not going to be a good responder. But the literature suggests this being the case. It could be one of the many reasons why, as we have discussed before, 5% topical minoxidil and 5 mg oral minoxidil had the same efficacy in the paper titled, quote, Oral Minoxidil versus Topical Minoxidil for Male Androgenetic Alopecia, unquote, by Penha et al. Well, this is all pretty new stuff, and we would love to continue exploring more of the science as things are always subjected to change. So, 
you can visit www.follygens.com to check it out. That's www.follygenz.com. Thanks for watching this video and for the support. This was a long time coming, a lot of research. I want to thank everyone who I'm working with. You know, this is uh this was this is something that I think a lot of people may benefit from. So try it out. Let me know how it works. Peace out, guys.